Hello and welcome back to Men's Day Out. Today we have with us someone who needs no introduction, former Supreme Court Judge Justice Markande Kaju. Thank you very much, sir, for taking out time and joining us on Men's Day Out today. My pleasure. So the reason uh, we have you here is because one, you have been always very candid about the matrimonial laws in India. You are somebody who has never shied away from talking about uh, pro-women laws as well as laws which could be misused by women. Recently, we came across one of your articles, which I would quote you, saw an insight to woos of dads whose kids were abducted by moms. So what made you write this kind of article, especially at a time where speaking anything in favor of men could be seen as taboo? See, I had been to America. I go there quite often. And a lot of young men met me there. And they were almost crying. And their grievance was that they had some girl who was living in India and they had brought her with themselves to America where they are working. They are settled in America. And that the child. And after some time, the girl, either because of differences with her husband or because she could not adjust in American society, she suddenly took the child away to India without even informing sometime at a time when the husband had gone to work. When he returned, he found his wife and his child missing. He had surreptitiously taken the child away to India. And thereafter, they have not been able to even see the child for years on end. Every father wants to uh, be with his child or at least meet him sometimes. But uh, the problem was that the child was in India and in India has not signed the Hague Convention which deals with this problem of abducted children and requires that the child be sent back to the country he has been he or she has been abducted. India has not signed the Hague Convention. So we are not governed by the Hague Convention but by our own uh, laws in India. We have the law on, on uh, custody of children in India. There are two things. Firstly, if the, the, the husband will have to file a case, he will have to come to India. He, now he has a job there in America. He can't give up his job. He can't leave America for long. Now he has to come to India, file a case. And the case drags on, as you know, in India, is here in 10 years, 15 years, then appeals and so on. So uh, the matter drags on for a long time. And even when it is decided, our court, you know, India is still a conservative country. And our courts are mainly inclined to think that the child, if particularly if he or she is very small, needs the love of the mother more than the father. So they normally award the custody of the child to the mother. Of course, they give visitation rights to the father. But that is useless. Can a father come from America for a week comes to India to meet his child? And he, he may risk losing his job. You are fired if you do that. And moreover, uh, sometimes the mother does not allow the father to meet the child. So they were weeping and they have a large number of them who are seeing this. Uh, and that is why I wrote that article. 
So you would agree that this problem is not really limited only to men who are working abroad, Indian men who are working abroad, but also to a lot, lot of people who reside in India because there can be a similar situation where the separated couple are living in two different cities or even living in the same city and the custody is awarded uh, to the mother and the father you know keeps uh, you know literally begging to court asking for access once a week once a month how do you foresee a breakthrough in this uh, matrimonial issue which is so critical when it comes to benefit or uh, you know the upbringing of children see the problem is more with uh, men abroad because you know you must understand now these young men they are living and working in america or europe they have a job. Now their employer will not allow them to leave for long periods. It is not appreciated there. You are there, you have been given a job, you have to work there. Now, so the problem is greater for those people living abroad. Yes, the problem is also with uh, young men living in India, but not as much as with those people living abroad. Because in India, at least, you are much nearer to the child, even in another city, you have visitation rights. The court may award the mother, but always grants visitation rights. Then the father can visit once a week or once a month or something like that. So the problem is greater with uh, young people living abroad. Right. So when you say uh, fathers are allowed access once a week, once a month, do you think it's a fair concept to actually, uh, you know, which could be good or bad for uh, the child? Do you think it's time that India moves towards a shared parenting concept where we actually get men or fathers into the fore of upbringing of children and uh, perhaps they could equally contribute and, uh, you know, look after the day-to-day -day activities? What is your take on this? Yes, of course, uh, the child needs both father and mother. That is true, but what supposing the father is living in Delhi, the mother takes the child away and moves to Bombay. Now, what do you mean by shared parenting? Do you expect the father to come three weeks in a week to Bombay? What do you mean by shared parenting? When they are not living together and the wife says she is unable to live with her husband, there is no question of shared parenting. It is single parenting. Shared parenting means both living together. But the very problem is because they are unable to live together. So don't you think we are being a little unfair to men because the minute a divorce happens or a separation happens, by default, you know, we say that uh, either men are uh, the ones who are the domestic abusers and therefore they don't really deserve to, you know, have custody of their children. How do you, you know, how can we really bridge this gap where, you know, men can also maybe, you know, in the sense where we say shared parenting, uh, of course, the men could have access for, uh, you know, two, three months in the year or maybe 40% in the uh, times in the year where the child is on a break or on a holiday, but giving him access just once a week or once a month and then making him the actual provider financially, how fair do you think does this work? See, uh, first, you must know the laws of India. In our constitution, there is equality between the sexes. Article 15, Clause 1 of the Indian Constitution. But Article 15, Clause 3 says that any, uh, not with, notwithstanding anything in Article 15, Clause 1, uh, there can be laws which give special special rights to women. So there, there cannot be discrimination against women, but there can be discrimination in favor of women. That is in our constitution. And that provision was made because the constitution makers realize that ordinarily women in India are in a lower position as compared to men and they need more protection. So laws can be made in favor of women. They cannot be made against women. As regards the question of custody, I know that if the child is of tender age, he needs more affection of the mother. Yes, he also needs the father, so visitation rights are granted. 
sometimes uh, you know different kind of orders can be passed by courts they can permit that on weekends the the father can take the child to his own home but then it up the the weekend return the child to the mother so different kind of orders can be passed but really the if the child is of tender age most courts think that he should be he or she should be kept with the mother because the love of the mother is more required right sir so so we take your point that the laws in india are pro women and even at the cost of being anti men we do have to protect women more because uh, generally the concept is that they are the weaker sex yes that's right so that is in our constitution not not just in the ordinary laws that constitution article 15 clause 3 please have a look at it and the so constitution I'm is the highest law of the land absolutely so i'd like to draw your attention towards the anti dowry law and i have seen a couple of tweets by you where you have been very critical about the misuse that happens about this law you as a former judge would have also come across many cases where you know certain cases obviously you cannot rule out that they were absolutely false but then yes there would be cases where women filed a dowry case just to settle score or perhaps to teach a lesson to her in laws how do you think uh, can we arrest this problem because you would agree there are several men and their families who are you know picked up by police just on the word of women and uh, you know some uh, die by suicide some uh, go into mental depression Uh, how how do we really you know uh, kind of arrest this problem so that uh, you know in matrimonial cases you don't really criminalize uh, the men on mere word of woman i think you are talking of section 498 yes that's a right of the indian penal code that's true uh, section 498 was being uh, very much misused what was happening was that uh, whenever the wife and a quarrel with the husband and she he left the home of the husband went to a lawyer and the lawyer would advise immediately filing an fir under section 490 in which not only the husband but the husband's relatives aged grandmother grandparents aunts nieces cousins all were named and the police would go to arrest those people and and demand bribes if they did not want to be arrested all this was happening then the supreme court gave a judgment in 2017 rajesh kumar versus state of up you can look it up on in the supreme court said that this provision is being grossly misused and therefore now in future if such an fir is filed under 498 the police must not immediately arrest what has to be done is that the complaint has to be sent to uh, what is known as a family welfare committee which will examine whether the complaint is genuine bona fide or it is us and only if uh, the family welfare committee is prima facie satisfied it will submit a report to the court and only thereafter can the police arrest that person the police cannot immediately arrest the husband or his relatives just after filing of the fir and the, the uh, uh, designated police officer has to be appointed to look into and out whether it is bona fide or not so that protection has now been granted by the supreme court so now i think that danger is over oh so i do agree that the 2017 uh, judgment was uh, you know kind of cautioning the police not to go and directly arrest men and the families however on ground the realities are still very very different and as you also mentioned uh, you know that there could be uh, you know different motivation for the police to file different kinds of cases against the men uh you know sometimes uh, even without evidences so on the same note don't you think that when a 498a case is uh, you know uh, by the court when it is declared to be false 
do you think it's time to set precedence where women who file such false cases are also convicted or you know given some kind of punishment which acts as a deterrent in the future to file false cases yes there is already a provision in the penal code that if one files a uh, false fir <coughs> can be prosecuted there is already a provision in the penal code so but we don't really see any conviction for uh, women who file such false cases in fact i came across certain cases where you know uh, the court had asked the woman to pay a fine of 500 rupees and sit in the court for 6 hours because she happened to file a false case now do you think these kind of punishments would actually deter them to redo it in the future again you see firstly you must understand that all laws can be made. and it is for the courts to determine what should be the punishment in in the case of filing such a false fir i am not in favor of sending the girl to jail because now the protection is there what is the problem now the protection is there by rajesh kumar's case rajesh sharma's case that uh, the police cannot straight away arrest so the protection is there for the men folk what is the problem now it's right, so as i said on ground things are still very different and since we do observe a lot of cases on a day to day uh, you know basis uh, the ground on the ground uh, uh, listen all laws can be misused and you know a large part of the police is corrupt they will do all kind of wrong things despite the supreme court judgment if the police still arrest that that may also happen but now the law of the supreme court is the law. the police can be prosecuted for disobeying the judgment of supreme court they can be held up for contempt but in the bargain so you will agree what happens is uh, the minute the man is arrested the husband is arrested he loses his job his career his face in society and of course later on whatever happens to the case i mean you know nobody is really bothered about that so yes there is a problem you know when we are criminalizing matrimonial law i have already told you that that laws can be misused all laws can be misused so just because law can be misused there should be law against murder no law against against theft no law against rape because the laws can be supposing a false case of rape is filed by a girl totally false case so should we abolish the law against rape what are you trying to say so not abolish there but there will be no laws uh, not yes, laws can be misused i have already answered you laws can be misused but it doesn't mean you abolish laws there have to be laws in society absolutely so i'm not saying abolish but i'm saying what is the deterrent i mean let's say the woman remarries what is the deterrent that she will not file a false 498 case again on the second husband that is my limited point on this sir i've already replied to you now how many times can i reply that it is for the court to decide what should be the adequate punishment the court is not bound to send the girl to jail the court may impose fine there are various kinds of orders which can be passed sure sir so moving on uh, i'll draw your attention to the maintenance and alimony laws that we currently have which again uh, you know maintenance is granted to a woman before even looking at you know the entire merits of the case so let's say a couple reaches court uh, for a divorce matter and the interim maintenance starts with immediate effect now the term interim is really not defined there is no time period and it can go on indefinitely for years and decades uh, even uh, you know without the man being guilty or not how do you foresee this because a lot of countries globally have adopted some kind of timeline uh, looking at the duration in marriage uh, say if a marriage has lasted only for 6 months and the man has been expected to pay the woman for life how fair do you think is this law in current times you see when a man divorces his wife then normally maintenance is granted all over all over the world it is nothing unique to india and interim maintenance is only till the case is decided finally of course that may take many years because so the law can be misused it should mean that there should be no law supposing you say no no interim maintenance or you say interim maintenance only for 6 months so after 6 months, 
woman uh, starved with a with a child. See, j- just because a law can be misused doesn't mean that you should not have laws. Maintenance is granted all over the world, and now uh, the Supreme Court has said even Muslims have, have to grant maintenance. So, but in Kaira Banu, Kaira Banu's case, that even Muslims have to grant maintenance. Earlier, they were opposing this, but now the Supreme Court uh, Constitution bench has held that Muslims don't maintenance to the divorced wife. The so, when you say is a no- man. Normal, a man divorces his wife so when a divorce happens uh, it can be both ways right i mean you do see a lot of women also wa- wanting to walk out of marriage not purely because of the fault of the man uh, you also see a lot of educated and working women going to court uh, despite having a good salary they still want to have a monthly maintenance from the husband and you are about is not granted this. yes uh, no, no sir. listen you you have maintenance is not granted without the judge applying his mind if for example the husband can prove that this woman is in fact a prostitute or it is because of her that whole thing is the marriage has been broken up her, her misdeeds then the court may not grant maintenance so it is not that maintain grant of maintenance is uh, automatic you you have a misconception and the, the the court also looks into the income of both husband and the wife sometimes the husband may be jobless then how can he pay maintenance sometimes the wife may be earning adequate amount then the court will not grant maintenance so the court sees all these factors it is you have some misconception that the court automatically grants maintenance the moment the wife applies for it that is not so i have decided many maintenance cases i looked into all the factors and only then i grant maintenance not blindly so i agree as a judge you would have you know best uh, knowledge of judging both sides but then there are cases where men have filed cases of divorce uh, you know on, on on grounds of cruelty yet because the wife is not working uh, by default he has to pay so in uh, you know in fact you are actually making a man pay his wife who has been cruel to him then it in the court may not grant maintenance if the court finds that the separation or divorce is entirely due to the fault of the wife the court may not grant maintenance and sir so now since we are on this topic of maintenance which you know as i said there's no definite timeline uh, what do you think about you know the timeline for divorce cases because uh, knowing the kind of uh, you know uh, the courts the way they are flooded with number of cases do you really think matrimonial cases matter uh, much because you're again in times of covid you know everybody is getting dates after 6 months 9 months and you know once you go to court if it's a contested case people are you know fighting mere ego battles for 10 years 15 years 20 years is it time we bring irretrievable marriage breakdown as a ground for divorce in india yes yes that should be done it has been done in many countries but the point is that even deciding uh, that uh, whether the marriage has been irretrievably finished or not the court may take years years and years in deciding that issue whether the marriage has been irretrievably broken down See, in our country, the courts are flooded with cases. We have got maybe thirty-three, thirty-five million cases pending in our court, and a sizable section of them are matrimonial cases. All courts in India are flooded with the right district court, the high court, the supreme court. I know it because I was myself a lawyer in the high court of Allahabad. I dealt with many matrimonial cases, and as a judge in the high court and in supreme court. we are flooded with cases and it is very easy to say that why don't judges decide easily uh, why don't judges decide and decide cases quickly now people don't even know the situation prevailing in india i will tell you i will just give you one example in allahabad high court and allahabad high court had set a norm that no judge of the subordinate judiciary subordinate judiciary meaning up to district judge level below the high court should have more than 300 cases pending before him at one time now one judge of a subordinate judiciary 
he was, I think, Chief Judicial Magistrate Kanpur Nagar, came to meet me at Alaba. And I asked him, how many cases are there pending in your court alone? 30,000. Now, there should be not more than 300. We've got 100 times more than that. Another judge of subordinate judiciary, Chief Judicial Magistrate, Ghaziabad, came to meet me. I asked him, how many cases are pending in your court alone? He said, 21,000. A few years back, I went to Bulanshair and the Chief Judicial Magistrate Bulanshair met me and I asked him the same question. He said he has 25,000 cases pending. Now, when maximum load at one time, how can he carry 75 or 100 times that amount? If you place an elephant on top of the head of a man, will he not collapse? That is what has happened in our judiciary. So, what can the judge do except give date after date when he has thousands of cases pending? Once what happened, I'll tell you, I was a judge, acting chief justice of Alaba. And the family court judge, who was of the left rank of additional district judge, uh, she was a lady. She sought an appointment and came to meet me in my chamber. And she was crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I have 5,000 matrimonial cases pending in my court alone. And I receive orders from High Court judges that you decide this divorce case in two months. No, to decide a case takes time. It can't be done in one second. You have to first read the readings of the party. You have to get evidence, cross-examination, then hear the arguments of both sides, deliberate over the matter. Then only a high quality judgment can come. It can't come in one second. We are not supermen. And to tell a judge who has 5,000 cases that decide each of them in, within two months, it's just not possible. So, of course, I, 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 I changed that order. And But the point is that there's so much, uh, so many matrimonial cases. You know, what has happened, I tell you, in Indian society, uh, earlier, maybe 75 or 100 years earlier, uh, children were married at a very young age by their parents. The boy was 14 years of age, the girl was 12 or 13, and they were married. And they grew up together, they became friends. At that age, you know, the personality is very flexible, not rigid. So, adjustment is easy. You grow up together, not just as husband and wife, but as friends. And there were no divorces. Today, what is happening is the girl is 27, 28, and often she is herself working, earning a good amount, and they are introduced only once or twice by their parents. There's no dating system, you don't know each other. And you just ask whether you, you agree to marry this young man, and you say yes. Now you marry him, but you realize you are living with a stranger. And your personality has become rigid by the age of 27, 28. It's no longer flexible. You can't adjust to so many things. And you many men, they still have the feudal mentality. They want their husbands to be subordinate to them, obey their every command, which educated young women with self-respect will not do. They want equality. So there are often fights. Sometimes they can adjust, but sometimes they cannot adjust. And there's separation, divorce custody, maintenance, all kinds of cases. So, because <laughs> Indian society is uh, in a transitional period in our history, a lot of social churning going on in our society. And therefore, uh, the number of matrimonial cases has dipped by leaps and bounds. Just not manageable. There are so many of them. In, in America, most of these matrimonial cases are diverted for mediation. They are not decided by courts. And the mediator is a skilled person who tries to bring about an amicable, amicable compromise or some settlement. The mediation has been started, but it's not really developed. Most of the matters are decided by courts. And courts take years and years to decide a case. So this is the problem. This is a big social problem in India. Because our society is in great turmoil. A lot of social churning going on. 
so in no. your opinion uh, since you've already you know yourself mentioned that there is a problem with the number of cases that have lined up in your uh, you know best judgment what do you think we need to do with the current matrimonial law system does it need a complete overhaul or do you think we can continue with the same laws uh, maybe tweaking them little bit here and there i really have not uh, thought about it and i am very pessimistic that anything can be done because really no nobody is serious about this neither the the politicians are only serious about winning elections the lawyers are making money out of this in monuments they earn a huge amount of money so nobody is really interested in any amendment to the law which can really solve the situation i don't think anything will be done so on that note uh, i think what i can take back from this conversation is that yes the laws are biased towards women and uh, uh, maybe because india still carries the tag of being a patriarchal country a lot of men in the 21st century will have to bear the brunt of these matrimonial laws